Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me here. This is, for me, such an exciting opportunity to be here and to share this information with you and to give this workshop on what Kathy called a really crucial topic, and it is because every single day I see kids and families that come into my office who are describing the challenges that we think of when it comes to executive functioning weaknesses. And it's something that we see in all different types of learning disorders. It's present in different types of processing disorders. And it really cuts across so many different areas of life, not just in school, but outside of school also. I think it's amazing that every single one of you are here tonight to be able to learn more about how to help your child or to help somebody else another child that you might know with these different types of challenges. And so um, it's just great that you guys are here and I'm really excited to be able to give this talk. So, so um, I work at the Child Mind Institute where I'm a clinical neuropsychologist. Um, I finished my postdoctoral fellowship there in pediatric neuropsychology about two years ago and um, this is my second year there as a clinical staff member. In addition to our neuropsych team, we also provide treatment for kids that have a number of different challenges including anxiety, depression, um, behavioral uh, difficulties, and we actually just opened up an autism center recently as well. We also um, have a wing of our institute that is dedicated to research and really advancing the understanding of mental health disorders through neuroimaging. And we also do a lot of public education, this being one of those types of opportunities that we feel really strongly about. Um, partnering with schools and organizations in the community um, like Gillen Brewer, but we also have a ton of resources on our website that we distribute for free to parents and teachers as well. So the goals of tonight's presentation, what I'm going to focus on um, is first just identifying the different types of executive functioning skills out there. Um, the second being understanding how these skills develop over a child's lifetime. Also being able to give you guys some information about things that you could be doing at home. And you already might be doing so many of these different types of things. But maybe there are some things that you haven't thought of yet that could be helpful. Um, and it might just also give you a different perspective on your child and maybe how to respond to some things that your child might be doing that could be frustrating. Also, um, one of my goals is to help you guys as parents recognize what programs have really good evidence base behind them and what the research currently says about some of those interventions. As parents, I know how difficult it can be to sort through everything that's out there. There's just a tremendous amount of information, not only disseminated by um, scientists and researchers, but also just through the internet and everything that's out there. And it can be really confusing to understand. And executive functioning, what I'll say, is not an easy concept to understand. There's a lot of different skills involved. It's not just a unitary concept, which I'll talk about shortly. And every child has their own individual strengths and weaknesses in executive functioning, too. And so that's really the most important, the top most important point that I just want to start off with and for folks to keep in mind. When we talk about executive functioning difficulties, that really encompasses a wide range of skills and behaviors. So it's often, I hear a lot, oh, this kid has executive functioning problems, or their um, this executive symptoms are, are, are really, really severe, or um, things like that. But that doesn't actually tell me where a child's strengths and weaknesses truly lie. And what we know from executive functioning research is that a child that has a weakness in one area can also have a major strength in an, another area. So an example could be a child that has a lot of difficulty regulating their emotions and controlling out and uh, dealing with outbursts or, or a child who has trouble uh, tolerating changes in their routine but might be extremely diligent and organized and detail oriented. So it's really important to understand that executive functioning is a host of different skills and it's not just one overarching concept and I actually think we probably do a disservice to our kids by saying oh they just have executive functioning problems without actually really describing these things in better detail. The other important point to keep in mind is that these executive functioning skills can be continually fostered and bolstered throughout a child's development. 
they don't, you can, there are so many different opportunities as parents that you guys can do. And it doesn't just have to be the strategies and the interventions and the stuff that you read online and the stuff that you read in books and the, and the evidence-based research. It's just giving the child the opportunity to learn new skills, to teach them different skills, to learn how to cope effectively, to be able to self-regulate independently. And those opportunities can exist throughout the entire day. So if you go to a supermarket, Help your, if you have your child, help you make a list of the things that you need. If the child's having a really tough time at school, giving them strategies that they can use to calm themselves down when they're feeling anxious. By doing that, all what you're continually doing is teaching them these skills, and those skills can continually be fostered and developed. And there's really no time limit either, because we know that executive functioning continues to develop and in different growth spurts, and we'll talk about that shortly, but in different uh, spurts throughout the lifespan and actually don't even peak until our mid-late 20s. So there really is so much time and there are so many different opportunities out there to continue to foster and um, help these skills develop. We also know that people don't lack executive functioning skills, right? It's not that a child or an adult just doesn't, it doesn't exist. It's that maybe some of these skills might be developmentally lagging compared to others and or might not be a good fit with the context of the environment, which I think is something really important that I see quite often. But that doesn't mean that we can't help and we can't um, close the gap and continue to make sure that these skills continue to develop. Um, right, you still have time, we talked about that. An important thing that um, comes to mind for me also as parents is being able to be your child's coach. And that is a big part of executive functioning skill development as well. As parents, you have so many responsibilities and so many things that you have to do throughout the day. And it can feel so overwhelming at times to be able to manage all the different things that you need to do and also to help your child as well. But the biggest piece and the most important thing that you guys can do for your child is continue to be their coach. Guide them through uh, different situations. Teach them and break down new skills and concepts. Share your knowledge and your strengths with them because I'm sure you all have your own unique strengths also that you can use to foster your child's weaknesses. And that also brings me to a later point of um, understanding your own executive skills, strengths, and weaknesses I think is really, really crucial as well. So you might be a parent who's extremely well organized and your child might have some difficulties keeping track of their materials. They might always need reminders and prompts because they're losing things. Their backpack or their room might be a complete mess. But you might be super organized and those things to you feel even more frustrating <laughs> because for you it feels like that comes so easy to me that I don't understand why do they struggle so much with these things. So I think it's really important just to be aware of your strengths, not only so you can, I think, guide and manage your own expectations, but also so you can share your own strengths with your child and help fill in some of the gaps for them. So if you're really good at organizing and knowing how to keep track of your stuff, teach them some of the skills and do it explicitly. And they might not get it the first time, they might not get it the second time, but with repetition and practice and hard work, over time they will be able to get it. So those are just some important points before we jump into some of the, um, the meteor <laughs> um, um, types of information. So I just want to briefly go over a history of executive functioning skills. Um, I think it's important to understand these things in a, in a broader historical context so we can understand how we started and then where we got to today as far as the field and the science goes. So um, there's an early case example. Um, who's taking an introduction to psychology course here when they were in college or at some point? OK, a couple of you, right? So I don't. It, most intro psych classes talk about this guy, Phineas Gage. So Phineas Gage was a railroad worker, and um, he was working on um, a 
project one day and a railroad spike, a tamp, suddenly um, came loose and flew through his brain and actually exited on the other side. It's a really gruesome story. <laughs> um, but he actually was pretty conscious throughout the entire experience, knew exactly what was going on, could retell the whole incident actually very accurately, and survived and was totally fine, except people noticed that there were a lot of changes to his personality. So whereas he used to be um, very thoughtful and organized and well-mannered, after this accident, people noticed a really big change in his personality. He was. Um, he couldn't keep track of his stuff. He became easily frustrated. He was rude and impulsive. And so that sort of, before executive functioning as a concept even existed, this idea that there's something in the frontal lobes, the frontal part of our brain that regulates our behavior, our emotions, and our cognition, and it's seated here in, fr in the front of our brain, that was, um, that was there. And that started to, um, that started to pique people's interest. The actual term executive functioning was introduced not that long ago, actually. I found this really surprising as I was looking up some research and going through the history. In the early 70s, um, they started to do some research understanding how lesions to the prefrontal cortex, which again sits right behind your, behind your forehead and your brain, how that can affect behavior in monkeys and humans. At first, folks thought that executive functioning skills, again, were, were this was this unitary concept. And so they just described it as such in the research literature. However, advances in neuroimaging and our understanding of these things led us to actually be able to isolate different skills that are part of executive functioning. So nowadays, the way that we think about executive functioning, instead of one construct, we actually think of it as a set of different skills that are interrelated and in, in, in play, in, interwoven with each other and have a constantly dynamic dynamic interacting effect on one another, which I'll get to in a, uh, shortly also. So it's become an umbrella term, but it's really important to understand that there are a number of different skills within this broader construct. So this is sort of a busy slide with a couple different, um, <laughs> uh, a lot of different visuals on it. Um, but these are sort of what are, I think, pretty agreed upon executive function terms. And all of these things, again, it's important to understand, even though these are discrete skills, they interact with one another constantly. And they act also on a subconscious level. We're not always thinking about planning. We're not always thinking about executive functioning skills. These things are operating oftentimes outside of our awareness, actually. Um, but these things are important not only, as you can imagine, for school and for academics, but also just for day-to-day -day functioning. Interacting with peers, um, working with adults, um, going out places. All of these skills are involved in all these different things, and they're constantly being used throughout the day. So I'm going to talk about a couple of them. I'm not going to go through every single one. And I'm actually going to break it down a little bit more because it can be confusing when thinking about all these different types of skills. But I'll quickly go over a couple of them. So one of the main skills that we often refer to is called inhibition. And that's the ability to control our impulses, to sort of stop and think before acting, um, and refraining from inappropriate behavior. Another major term we think about is flexibility. So that's really taking new steps to reach a solution and being able to shift from one thing to the next. Emotional control is another important concept for us being able to regulate um, frustrating moments, which can happen thr throughout the entirety of the day. But realizing if a small slight happens, to not have an overreaction, that requires emotional control. And I don't know if you guys are starting to notice, but we are executive functioning skills are not just organizational skills, right? Part of there are a lot of organizational skills involved, but a lot of it is also emotional and behavioral regulation skills as well. And that's the interesting thing about executive functioning. They sort of exist right at that cross section of cognition and behavior. And they're really these higher level skills that are able to regulate behavior and cognition simultaneously. So this is a slide just sort of giving you guys an idea of how some of these different skill challenges and weaknesses can manifest in day-to-day -day life. 
So a child, for instance, that has trouble with inhibiting their impulses or in the inhibition skill, they might be the child who's constantly calling out in class and interrupting grandma or um, you know, Aunt Ida when they come over and they're telling a really boring story. <laughs> um, flexibility refers to um, Right, those difficulty um, um, being able to switch from one thing to the next. So we see kids that have challenges being flexible. Oftentimes, they have difficulty going from one activity to the next. They need a lot of reminders ahead of time of what's going to come next, and they also might need countdowns and things so that they can use that foresight to think, oh yeah, I have to do this next. And then there are other skills involved. What do I need? Where are my belongings? Where's my jacket? Where's my coat, for instance, before going out to recess? But even just being able to shift from, say, homework to going outside or homework to dinner time, right? That in itself requires flexibility. And oftentimes we see kids who have challenges with flexibility are often um, some of our most anxious children as well because they get stuck and they become fixed on a routine or something that they need. Um, emotional control, we see that these kids often um, have a lot of difficulty handling their frustrations. They might throw a big temper tantrum over a small slight and event. Okay, so all of these different skills have manifestations, and again, it's not just related to the school environment, but it's, it's at home and it's in the community, and, what, and it's what you guys might see on a day-to-day -day basis. To distill this a little bit more though, we tend to see five major challenges in executive functioning skills. The first being concrete thinking. Again, being able to think flexibly, being able to think outside the box, being able to um, adapt to a new change, being able to shift from one thing to the next. Oftentimes kids that have some sort of executive functioning difficulties with flexibility will be rigid concrete thinkers. They sometimes have trouble, I often hear, they have trouble sort of getting the big picture. <laughs> um, they can understand the details, but seeing the forest for the trees becomes extremely challenging for them. We also see self-awareness being a really major difficulty that a lot of kids tend to have. Understanding how their behavior can impact somebody else. The effect of um, making a rude comment or saying something inappropriate and understanding how that might affect their relationship with that person or um, understanding the impact of something like something that they might have done at home and understanding the full impact that it might have on you guys also as parents. Inhibition and stopping, again, talking about being able to control your impulses, stop yourself in the moment, that's really important. And also shifting behavior and then starting and initiating. So a lot of kids that I see, um, these are the kids who take so long to get started on their homework at night. They need like 15 reminders to go to the seat, take out their books, and it's like, it's like they need like almost like a step-by-step -step breakdown of exactly what they need to do in those constant reminders. And these kids are often the ones, the ones who have trouble starting and initiating, are often seen as the ones who are lazy or unmotivated, right? And we hear that term a lot. And I think of laziness and unmotivation as a real thing because that's what these behaviors seem like. <laughs> like, they do seem lazy. They do seem unmotivated. It doesn't seem like they care. But oftentimes they do care. It's just really hard for them to get started on these things. It's not that they can't. It's just that it takes a lot more mental effort and it takes a lot more practice and it takes a lot more repetition and they might need these things broken down and explained directly and explicitly many more times than, say, another child their same age. Within the executive function, I talked a little bit about how there's all these different skills. With executive function, it's also important to understand that there's a lot of different models out there right now. So there are so many different definitions in the literature, which also makes understanding this stuff and distilling it for you guys extremely challenging um, as professionals. Um, I'm using tonight for, our, for, the, for the purposes of this presentation, Adele Diamond's model of executive functioning. Adele Diamond is one of the most prolific researchers on executive functioning. She does a lot of work actually with young kids and preschoolers and how executive functions develop over the lifespan. And she 
she theorizes and she thinks about executive functioning actually within just relying on these three different types of executive functions as forming the backbone of this concept. So she really believes that working memory, inhibitory control, and cognitive flexibility are the three most crucial and foundational executive functioning skills, and then everything else builds upon those skills. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit more about each one. So working memory is something that we are using constantly throughout the school day uh, and throughout our lives. Right now we're using a ton of working memory. You're listening to what I'm saying, you're holding it in your mind, you're thinking about it, you're mulling it over. Some of you I see are taking notes. That in itself requires a ton of working memory because you have to hold on to what I'm saying you through a verbal auditory route, take that information, transfer it to your paper. So taking notes is one of those things that requires a ton of working memory. So working memory is really the ability to hold information in your mind. Think of it almost as a, a mental scratch pad. The cool thing about working memory, what they found is that there's actually, well I think that's cool, but there's two different routes of working memory. So there's the visual spatial sketch pad. So this is where we hold and manipulate uh, different types of visual information. And I think it's a really apt term, sketchpad, because you can even visualize what that looks like. And then there's the phonological or auditory route. So this is taking in information verbally and auditorily. And these two systems interact with one another. So even though they're distinct for handling different types of information and processing different types of information, they are working together at all times to update and continuously keep track of things. So for those who are taking notes right now, you're using both. You're being able to concentrate on the paper, look at your notes, being able to make changes or corrections, um, and also listening to me at the same time. Um, working memory is really important also for understanding things in a chronological sequence, so understanding the ordering of things. So to me, that brings up the kids that have planning difficulties, right? Because oftentimes, they don't even know where to begin. It's like they need step one, step two, step three, explicitly taught to them, and something external, because internally in their mind, they can't even come up with that type of concept. It's just hard for them. And actually, I'll shy away from can't, because I think they can, it's just harder. And I think that's important for a lot of these things to understand is that it's not that, again, anyone lacks these things completely. It's just so much harder to do. It doesn't come as effortlessly and automatically and unconsciously as it does for many other folks. So kids often have to struggle to pay attention more. And it actually is for them a mental struggle. Um, one of my colleagues will actually be doing a presentation, I think in March, March 5th, on working memory, a whole presentation, because we could talk about working memory forever. So, um, so come to that if you're interested in finding out more. Um, so another, the other major core executive skill within Adele Diamond's model is inhibitory control, which she subdivides into a couple of different skills as well. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but you should just know that there's interference control, which is the ability to um, regulate our thoughts. And then there's response inhibition, which is the ability to regulate our behaviors. And this is important. These are important skills for basically filtering out distractions in order to stay focused on a goal. So say you have to, your child's assigned a, a reading assignment um, where they have to do like a read and write or something like that. So they have to stay focused for a long period of time on the text. They have to go through the text. They have to hold that information in working memory. And they have to continue to block out distractions. Say the TV's on in another room or they're brother or sister is making a lot of noise. They have to continuously block out and filter out those distractions to stay focused. In kids that have weaknesses in this skill, it can be really hard for them to filter out all of those things that are distracting and going on in their environment to just stay focused. It's also the skill, like if you're in a crowded, if you're in a party or a crowded room and you're just trying to have a conversation one-on-one -on -one with somebody, that's what you're using in that moment. You're blocking out all the sound from your environment to be able to engage in that conversation with that person across from you. And then there's cognitive flexibility, which we talked about a little bit, being able to shift and adapt to new demands. So these skills, like I mentioned already, there's a ton of interplay. And they constantly work together. Even though they're distinct skills, they are constantly helping each other out in different ways. 
And Adele Diamond, her model is that these foundational skills, working memory, inhibitory control, cognitive flexibility, they give way to all the other higher order executive functioning skills that we know are important as well, such as reasoning, being able to go beyond what's going on in the moment to sort of understand the underlying theme or message, problem solving, being able to actively figure out how to get to a solution in planning, being able to know what steps you need to take to get to that solution. In order to do all of those things, which definitely become more demanding, especially as kids progress through middle school, teenage, adolescent years, you need these foundational skills. And if there's a weakness in one of these, it can interrupt the rest of the system. And you might see challenges here, here, and here, potentially due to one of these foundational weaknesses. Now that's her model. Again, there's no one agreed upon perfect definition out there. There's no solid, we don't have enough there yet to be able to come to one uh, model that we all have consensus on, but that's Adele Diamond's uh, model and, and that's the way she thinks about it. And I think that's a nice way of thinking about it um, and what I often see in our clinic. So I'm going to talk a little bit about basic anatomy and the development executive functioning skills. And to me, this is one of the most important things that I can actually talk to you guys about tonight. And the reason for that is because um, oftentimes I see executive functioning thought about synonymously with organizational skills in middle school and high school. That's not it. We actually know that executive functioning skills develop early on, beginning in infancy. Infants have very rudimentary executive functioning skills, and these skills continue to develop, again, throughout the lifespan, and don't peak until mid-late 20s. So it's really important to understand also that different skills come online at different times, and so we have to be mindful of the context and the expectations also for these different skills. Because if we're putting too much pressure on a kid to use a skill that they haven't yet developed, then that's going to create, it's not going to be a good fit. There's just no goodness of fit, and that can also lead to a lot of frustration. And so it's just important to understand also when these skills develop and at what time and what you can expect developmentally. So um, some folks think also about executive functionings as, as cool and hot executive functioning. So cool executive functioning refers more to, I guess, probably what most people think of when they think of these skills, the organizational skills, the planning, the attentional skills, attentional control, right? Um, and that these skills are really central to problem solving and, and staying focused. But there are also these other skills that are super important called hot executive functioning skills, which are more of those behavioral and emotional regulation skills. And those terms are pretty apt, I think, also for thinking about like these different types of skills and behaviors. And they actually have pretty circumscribed brain regions for each of these skill areas. So executive functioning skills I mentioned live and are primarily housed in the prefrontal cortex, that area of our brain that sits right behind our forehead. And the front of the brain is kind of a funny thing because um, it actually sort of goes down and underneath as well. I'll show you guys here too with my, there, yeah, 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 there we go. Uh, whatever. <laughs> Maybe not. But, but you can see it sort of folds underneath, right? And so that's the belly of the frontal lobe. And so we actually refer to that as the ventral part, the belly uh, um, of the frontal lobes. And these areas down here, the ventral regions, they actually are the ones where, the, where that's where your hot EF skills live. That's where your emotional and behavioral regulation skills hang out. And the reason they're down there is because they actually project connections to these deeper parts of the brain that are also really important for regulating emotions and for creating memories. And that's really important to understand also because memories are not just created without any emotional valence to them, right? You remember things that feel emotionally meaningful to you. So executive functioning in the frontal lobes are super involved in creating memories too. And we see that these hot EF skills live down here in the belly. On the top, which flows this way, this stream, this is, this is where the cool EF skills live. And so this is where we see online process of 
processing of information, um, holding information, planning and organizing. But again, these skills are all integrated. In order to plan and organize, you got to keep your cool. If you're frustrated or upset at work over something a colleague said to you, it's going to be really hard to focus. If you're anxious about a deadline, it's going to be really hard to plan your next day's assignment, right? We've all experienced that. So these areas are constantly talking to each other, and these areas project numerous connections to all different parts of the brain. Because the executive functioning skills are the seat of cognition. They basically, they're, they're the orchestrator. They tell all these different other parts and areas what to do. So when we think about the development of these skills, again, we know that they develop um, early on. They're present in infancy. We've done research studies. We found that these skills can begin in infancy. And then they develop rapidly throughout childhood. And there are different spurts for different types of skills, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, executive functioning skills don't develop linearly. So it's not just like a whoosh. It's more like a kind of thing up. And then they start to decline, actually, into old age a bit. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I guess not, right? So then um, it's also important to understand that these skills don't, in, the brain doesn't develop without the larger context of the environment, right? The environment is constantly reinforcing experiences and changing the way the brain works. There's a ton of research out there. We know now that neuroplasticity is a real thing. We know that the brain can actually rewire itself with certain types of interventions, with certain types of programs, which is amazing. And so there's a constant interaction from the environment. Even from a very, very young age, we know how important the environment can be to good brain development and good brain health. So this is a slide just showing, um, and I think this is actually a pretty neat slide because it, it shows also that the executive functioning skills within the brain are actually the last parts of the brain to develop. One more time. Executive functioning skills are the last, the areas that, where these things live are the last parts of the brain to develop. So we see, for instance, um, the five-year-old brain, okay, the sort of the hot colors represent um, uh, not as much development, whereas the cool colors represent more development. So we see a lot of these, uh, the back of the brain, the occipital lobe. Occipital is actually where our visual processing takes place. Young children are using a lot of visual cues to be able to process information. We know at this point also these language and memory areas that live here in the temporal lobes, which you can't really see from this angle, but are going downwards. That's when kids enter preschool. They start getting a lot of language experiences. And then you see here at the front, at the top, right, where that box is, that's where those executive function skills live. And you see how underdeveloped they are compared to the rest of the child's brain. As children and individuals continue to develop preteen, teen, 20-year-old brain, we see that executive functioning skills are still the last part of the brain to develop. In this, yes? Um, how, are you, how are you defining uh, development? So I think this slide, so they, this is pretty broad. So they, they call it more fully matured. So I don't know exactly how they're measuring it. My guess would either be typically how they measure it is either based on gray matter volume um, and maybe white matter volume. But my guess is probably gray matter volume. So some measure, of, so it's anatomical. Yes. Yep. Okay. yep. And this is for all humans, by the way. Um, so again, we know that ex there, that executive function skills don't develop linearly. They actually develop in these different types of spurts. And so you see, even from a very young age, some of these skills are there. And then once children start hitting around three, four, five, we see a big uptick in the proficiency of a lot of these different skills. And that continues on as well until about six to eight years old. And then it sort of flattens out a little bit, but it keeps on going up. And then it takes another peak, again, somewhere it looks like in the uh, um, uh, late teens, early 20s. And then it hits its top peak in mid to late 20s. And then it sort of flattens out, and then it starts declining after that. So in infancy, like I mentioned, even young children, 
from the ages of the first one or two months, your, your baby looks like a blob, right? And it's like, they're just like a blob. And it seems like they're mostly reactive to a lot of the information that they're receiving. And indeed, most infants are quite reactive to information. But even as early as about two months old, that's when we see the development of very rudimer rudimentary executive functioning skills, including working memory. For a child, it's showing them an object and then placing it as somewhere else, and they will remember for a brief period where that object was placed. We also see the beginning of joint attention and social referencing. So um, even young, young children um, at one to two years old can understand, they can look at someone's facial expression, they can look at their caregiver, and they can read their emotional expression to understand how that adult feels about a certain object in their environment and they can actually begin to reference that on their own. So these skills really develop quite early on. And obviously it's very rudimentary, but that's when they really start to develop. In early school years, again, we see that rapid development really between the ages of three to five. And then by age five, we see a major surge as well. And we think it's because that's when a lot of kids are entering formal schooling. So they're getting more exposure to language. They're getting more exposure to different social interactions. There's more opportunities for them to self-regulate. And they are expected to self-regulate -regula a little bit more in the classroom. Obviously, they're still in kindergarten and preschool there's a lot of play and a lot of just basic things, but they're learning and they're using their executive functioning skills every single day to be able to, for instance, understand sounds and language, which is using working memory often. Um, being able to understand letter sound correspondences, know the B makes the bus sound. Being able to start to control their motor movements to draw very rudimentary shapes. All of these things start to develop. Delaying gratification, waiting for their reward or a prize um, for working on a goal, okay? So by age five, a lot of preschool children can start to develop these skills and have a lot of these skills. They can also follow one to two step simple directions. So there's things that are starting to develop and progress then. By middle and late childhood, we see more gains in sustained attention and vigilance. So being able to concentrate and sit still and focus on your homework assignment or what the teacher is telling you in class, those skills become more crucial and important during these years. And by this time, a lot of these kids can do it. And the kids that are coming to our clinic and the kids that we're seeing are often the kids that are having trouble being able to stay focused on their assignments. Um, they are often the ones who are getting very easily distracted by the things that are going around, uh, things happening about them. Um, they might start to have some trouble with some of their social interactions because the development of social context also changes. Kids are really interested more in rules and not so interested in just free play and excitement. So that's when I tend to see a lot of kids really in these ages around eight to 10 years old. And I'm always thinking about looking at some of these executive functioning skills to perhaps explain something of what's going on here. By 11 and 12 years old, working memory comes more online, and we see another big developmental spurt in strategic and goal-directed behavior. So that's when kids really start to get into early middle school years. They have to organize their belongings. They have to move from one class to the other. They have multiple teachers. It's not just one now. The social complexities become much more. They have to think about setting up their own play dates and things like that. By adolescence, we see that attentional control really starts to pick up um, around age 16. Working memory gets to about near maturity by age 19. Adolescents can successfully engage in problem solving by integrating multiple executive functioning skills. They can self-monitor and understand the impact of their behavior, but these uh, areas are still not very mature. Oftentimes we, um, we see and we hear adolescents and teens who um, they have these skills, or they should have these skills, or they know what they should do, but man, they just can't do it. <laughs> like, what's going on? What's getting in the way? And, and we see somewhat of a discrepancy there, um, where you have the knowledge, and they have these skills developed, but there's still sort of a block in their ability to follow through and do these things. Um, we also know that 
executive functions are not fully developed until adulthood, right? So that's why we see also when we think about adolescence, risky behaviors become really, really one of these things that, um, that, that crops up often in kids that have executive functioning difficulties. We know, for instance, kids with ADHD, for instance, have much higher rates of substance abuse and, um, and other risk-taking behaviors because their frontal lobes and these executive functions are not fully developed and they're gonna be more prone to engage in some of these things that other people can sort of damp down on their impulses and shy away from. So by adulthood, that's when we actually see the full development of executive functioning skills, and then that plateau as we talked about. So this is an ongoing and evolutionary process, and which means also, and I think sort of my takeaway from this is that there's so many opportunities and places to intervene as well. And even if, um, even if a child's having challenges later on, it doesn't mean that there's not things that you can do to be able to help them out and help them build up those executive functioning skills because there's, there's still time, there's still things that you can do to foster that brain development. So how does EF play into academics? EF is actually one of these things that has a major impact on all different types of academic subjects. Reading, writing, and math, it really forms the core, it, it really underlies so many skills within each of these subjects. And when I have families that come in to the clinic, I explain often that executive functioning difficulties, even if it's not something like dyslexia or dysgraphia or dyscalculia, which is a math disability, executive functions are still a type of processing deficit. To me, they don't just have a subject specific area of weakness, they can really interfere with learning on a more global basis. Okay, so you might not see an impairment in just one specific area of learning. You can, you can have a child that has dyslexia and executive functioning issues because they might have ADHD or something else, but executive functioning challenges are processing challenges that affect all different types of learning. So we also know the context, again, is so, so important. I'm just going to keep drilling this home. In kindergarten, there is daily routines that we have to keep track of. Moving from home to school, by first grade, kids are starting to learn more basic academic skills. By third grade, we understand that it's not just about teaching kids to learn how to read, for instance, they now actually have to use their reading skills to be able to master content and acquire knowledge. Um, oftentimes we're not, unfortunately, waiting for a lot of that. We're, we're keep on, a lot of teachers keep on going, even if a kid hasn't mastered reading skill yet. Um, we're writing to share ideas, okay? So the demands of the environment in school also tend to place tend to rely more on executive functioning skills as kids get older. And that's really important to keep in mind because I will see a lot of families for the first time and their kids might be in middle school or high school and this is the first time perhaps the rubber is hitting the road where things are becoming just too much for them to keep up with. They may have coasted by an elementary school because they're bright and they're smart and they have all these other good cognitive capacities to foster their ability to learn. But when they have to keep and stay organized, when there's a lot more demands for them to take notes and manage multiple subjects, deal with increased con um, content complexity, that's when we sometimes see a breakdown. And it's often due to some underlying vulnerability in some of these executive functioning skills, which may not have been identified. Because these kids can compensate really well, especially our bright learners. So let's talk a little bit about reading. What makes a successful reader? There's actually three main processes that are going on. The first is word recognition, which is just being able to recognize and read words on a very modular, simple level. In order to read words, which sounds like a really rudimentary process, but it's not, there's actually so many different cognitive skills involved in just word reading. One of them being phonological awareness, which is being able to understand and manipulate sounds the, within the English language. We also have to rely on decoding, using the sounds, mapping together letters and sounds, and then being able to use phonetic skills and our phonics to read irregular words. And sight word reading, being able to acquire a vast amount of words that get stored in our mind and they're just automatic for us. 
That's part of reading. That's, in that in itself, we see kids that have dyslexia, this is where they're struggling. This is the issues right here. However, we also see some kids that have trouble reading due to language comprehension issues. They might have weak vocabulary. And it could be in part due to the fact that they're not reading as much, so they're not acquiring as many vocabulary words. But it could also be that they have trouble with some part of language processing, which gets in the way of vocabulary. Understanding language structures, being able to reason with verbal concepts, and also accumulating a lot of background knowledge about what you're reading is important. Executive functioning skills are the third main component that is involved in reading, though. We're using working memory, inhibition, and cognitive flexibility when it comes to reading. And I'm going to show you guys how. First, we'll talk about working memory and reading. So we actually have evidence that working memory is involved not only in that word recognition process, in being able to understand and manipulate sounds in our mind, Okay, but we also know that working memory deficits are linked to poor comprehension, even in those kids who have great word reading skills. So you might have a child at home who can has a large vocabulary and can recognize sight words so easily, and you give them a list of words to read, and they have no problems because their phonics are great, no issues there. But these are the kids who with executive functioning weaknesses, you'll often see trouble with reading comprehension, pulling away the meaning from text, understanding the underlying theme and what's going on in the story. And part of that is working memory, because working memory, OK, you need to access and hold on to a ton of semantic information while you're reading. You also need to think about what the words that you're reading actually mean, if they are in your vocabulary. You need to store and update concepts continuously while you're reading text. You also have to be able to detect different sorts of inconsistencies, things that don't really match up as well. So there's a lot of working memory that goes into reading comprehension. Um, again, what we know is that executive functioning deficits tend to be secondary amongst children with dyslexia. Children with dyslexia tend to have more of those phonological phonics decoding issues and word recognition issues. But executive functioning deficits are primary, primary amongst those with specific reading comprehension problems. Okay, so that's a, we know that these skills are, are crucial. These and language comprehension really form the backbone. Um, without, if they don't have any word reading issues, form the backbone of comprehension. Working memory and writing. We know that working memory is so, so involved in writing. I see a lot of kids that come into my clinic that have executive functioning problems, and the first thing that I see as being a problem or what I hear about often is their writing stinks. And it can be down to sort of the basic skills like orthography, which is um, written, just written letters, okay, being able to spell correctly and things like that, to more complex skills like sentence construction, being able to take a lot of words and being able to string them together to form sentences. And executive functioning and working memory work are really important for writing also because you have to hold a lot of information in your mind and then transfer it then onto the paper. So there's a lot that's going on. We also, when you're writing, you're coordinating your attention to detail. You're maintaining focus and attention. You're blocking out internally distracting thoughts as well, right? To be able to organize your thoughts correctly. Another way I like to think of writing, writing is written communication. It's not verbal communication, but it's written communication. The purpose of writing is to communicate our thoughts and ideas. And children that have working memory or executive functioning difficulties will often have difficulty with writing due to a breakdown in some of these skills. As I mentioned before, taking notes requires a lot of working memory. Um, so we don't need to spend too much time on this. And then with mathematics, we see also executive functions become really, really important. Um, working memory actually seems to be one of the strongest predictors of um, a math disability or um, math weakness or for struggling math students. Um, it is one of the strongest predictors compared to all other different cognitive skills. Why? So within the phonological loop, that's where we're retrieving math facts. Math facts are actually coded through a linguistic code, and so we actually have to retrieve them through that phonological loop. The visual spatial sketch pad, 
oftentimes these, um, you might actually, I see a lot of kids who parents will say, my kid is all, they do all mental math. And, and that's like the strategy they rely on. But sometimes they'll make mistakes. And it could be because their working memory capacity is only so limited. It can only do so much. And it might overflow. It might get caught up with other distracting ideas. And a lot of these kids also are reluctant to write down what they're actually working on because they might have some motor weaknesses, and writing can be hard for them as well. Um, but we know that that visual spatial sketch pad, that visual mind's eye, right, is really important for doing mental math. Um, and then the central executive system, which really modulates the interaction between the two systems, um, is important for uh, deciphering word problems, transcoding different operations. Beyond just working memory, we know that executive functioning weaknesses can also get in the way of kids being able to pay attention to operation signs. Um, I tend to see a lot of kids when they're working on our math tests that we give them in the clinic, they'll often subtract when they need to add. Um, and it's just, it's, they're not focused on the sign. They, have, they need a cue to be able to focus on, on the sign to be able to do the right thing. They might misalign values. Um, being able to select the right math algorithm or formula that you need to solve a problem, that's also using executive functioning because you're retrieving information, you're organizing that information in your mind. So really, executive functioning skills, they are processing weakness. They, it's, it's a very um, broad processing weakness because as we can see, it can really get in the way of a lot of different academic subjects. And not all kids with executive functioning weaknesses is important will have these academic difficulties, but they might be at greater risk for these academic difficulties, and you might see some of these things on a day to on a day to day basis. As far as yes. How does one measure? Great question. So there's a lot of different ways to measure working memory. The Probably the most often used instrument um, or uh, task of working memory um, that's looking at auditory memory is what's called a digit span task. So, um, how can I show? So, it's actually a very easy task to show. So, I'll say to the child, I'm going to read you, um, I'm going to say some numbers out loud. Just repeat what I say, repeat after me. And so, we start pretty simple. So, I'll say 2 9 and they just have to repeat back 2, 9. And then the strings of digits get longer and longer. So I'll say 3, 2, 7, 8. So in that case, they have to repeat back 3, 2, 7, 8. What are they doing? They're taking that information in. They're holding on to it for a brief period of time in order to then repeat it back. That's the first type of condition. Then we sort of shift it up on them, and we say, OK, now I want you to, when I say the numbers, I want you to say them in backward order, reverse. Does anyone want to be a lucky? <laughs> Does anyone want to try? <laughs> so for instance, if I said 3, 9, 6, 6, 9, 3, exactly. But you have to take a second, that extra step of processing, that extra step of thinking, because not, not, no, you're actually, what you're doing in that moment is taking the information and manipulating it, okay? You're doing something with it. But it's a nice task because it looks at the ability to hold information and immediate awareness and then hold on to it and, and keep it in mind while, you're, while you work with it. What I'll say is that digit span tests are a pretty simple, kind of rudimentary type of test to get at this skill, though. So sometimes we see kids that come into the clinic who do extremely well on these types of digit span tasks or work um, or working memory tasks. But we see that in day-to-day -day life, they really have difficulty following more complex, extensive instructions. It's hard for them to manage doing multiple things at once. And that's because you have to remember, within our clinic, all the testing we're doing, it's one-on-one. -on -one, not any distractions, and so it's really trying to isolate those skills. But we know that throughout our lives, we're using these skills in concert, in tandem. And so we might say to a, we might say that 
your child still has working memory issues because the things you're describing to us are meaningful and these are things that are getting in their way of performing and doing the things that teachers and you guys expect them to do even though they can perform really well on some of these tasks. But I think it's important to note that, that there's sometimes discrepancies between performance on the test in the clinic and what folks see on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. What is the, what, how do you that's a great question. Um, brief answer is that um, it's really hard. I think, um, and, it, and it's hard because there's the, the people who do the research on short-term memory and working memory for a long time, people were doing, they were calling in their research everything involved in what we now call working memory, short-term memory. But as the research in the field evolved, people started to understand that it's not such a passive process um, using our short-term memory. In fact, using our short-term memory is a very active process. It's working. And so there is actually a change in how people refer to the concept in the literature. I, to me, they're pretty interchangeable terms. Um, I think of short-term memory as working memory. Um, and I like to refer to it as working memory because not only that's sort of where the research literature has led us, but also the actual process of using this skill is really more of an active type of skill, especially when we're measuring it through some of these tasks. But that's a great question. I'll take one more and then I'm going to, and then uh, save some questions for the end. Yeah. How does the technology um, affect executive functioning? Yes. Yeah. That's a great question because also. Now yeah. Everything is. Yeah. Brains yeah. And yeah. Brains and how does that yeah. What I'll say is we don't know entirely yet. Um, for me, in the way that I think about it, I think that you can use technology in really great ways to help kids develop executive functioning skills by partnering with them in using their technology, right? So oftentimes, and, and this is not a this is not a criticism or a downing or anything, but it 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 can be very easy to give your child a tablet or your phone just to play some games because life is hectic for us <laughs> and there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, but what we know is that. Um, you can use the tablet and screens as a way of actually engaging. And that engagement can actually help foster some of those executive functioning skills. So if they lose in a game and you're sitting with them and you're playing along with them, you can say, okay, what's that strategy that we worked on for calming our bodies? Okay, or let's count to 10 right now. I know you seem really frustrated. I can see it on your face. I can see it in your body. Um, you can also guide them through different um, other games and things on the phone and help them with using joint attention, praising them for the things that they're doing that you want them to do while they're using tablets and technology. So um, I don't necessarily see it as a bad thing, but I see it as a tool that can be used for good. Um, but, but it, can be, it can be hard, and I think we just don't know exactly how it affects the development of a lot of these different skills. Um, but we're starting to get somewhat of an idea, for sure. Um, as far as academic interventions, and this will sort of um, bleed into talking about interventions more generally, when we think about interventions for kids that have executive functioning difficulties that are affecting some part of their academics, and often that what we see is that reading comprehension, written expression as the demands get heavier, and um, more um, complex math often. We know that training an executive skill like training working memory, and there are a lot of computerized programs out there. You guys may have seen some of them. CogMed is an example of one that's very popular and used by a lot of school districts across the United States. CogMed? CogMed. CogMed. It's a commercialized program that's used often. What we know about these programs is that there's not a ton of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good near transfer, meaning that if you teach a child how to um, do a lot of working memory tasks and brain games that build and boost working memory, or you do a lot of these things that can boost inhibitory control or flexibility. It's going to improve, no doubt, those skills, but it doesn't always generalize into other areas of functioning. And so what we know, because they've studied this, is when you do sort of working memory interventions and then you see the impact on these different academic subjects, oftentimes you don't see a big boost in the academic skill. 
the way to be able to intervene in kids that have executive functioning challenges on an academic level is to be able to apply executive functioning skills to the subject that they're doing and the work that they're doing. So I'll give you an example. So for reading, if we're thinking about reading comprehension, strategies that rely on being able to break down different pieces of the text can be really helpful. Um, this is just one example of a, a reading strategy. There are a ton out there, but what we know is that kids that have these types of difficulties when it comes to reading comprehension, sometimes it's just a lot of information for them to process at once when they're reading a story, and it can be really helpful to break down each area of the story for them and review it and model and practice and repeat it. So you'll see in a lot of these types of strategies that are used for different subjects, a lot of really reoccurring themes and terms. Review, summarize, question. And you guys, this is stuff that, that should be fostered and developed and continue to be practiced and rehearsed constantly. So, and this is where as parents, it becomes really important to be your child's coach, right? And you can't always be there and you can't, there's no way to be their coach at all times, but for a little while you might need to be their coach until they can actually independently master this skill on their own. But the first couple of times, you might need to sit there with them and break it down and repeat it and practice and stay patient and reward them for when they're doing those things. And eventually you're gonna wanna scaffold away from those interventions because there's just no way to be their executive functioning frontal lobes, their second frontal lobe forever, right? It's just not possible. But what can be possible, what should be done, is really being able to get involved in the early stages of teaching any new skill until they can start to master it on their own. When it comes to writing, a lot of the strategies and interventions that are out there, and these are effective evidence-based strategies that have been studied and researched as well. Some of these strategies are also part of more comprehensive um, intervention programs. There's a program from the University of Kansas that's really nice called the Strategic Instruction Model. That's really a great program for literacy, reading comprehension, and writing issues in middle school and high school. Um, there are some other programs out there but essentially the idea is to be able to break down these different parts and then help them integrate the information on their own and again it's about teaching and modeling and rehearsing and practicing a lot in the beginning and eventually stepping back okay and scaffolding away so they can learn how to do it independently. So breaking down large assignments into more manage manageable steps. This is sort of a cute graphic organizer that I found online um, that, that can be used, though there's a ton out there. So how do we bolster some of these EF skills also at home and in school? And what are some strategies, strategies and things that, that you guys can be doing on a daily basis? So full, full disclosure, full disclaimer, um, a lot of these strategies are taken from one of my favorite resources um, for parents called Smart But Scattered. I don't get any royalties or commission. <laughs> um, but um, it is probably my, one of my favorite um, books for, uh, to recommend to parents because um, it gives a really nice overview of some of the stuff that we covered um, this evening, some of the background of executive functioning, how to manage your expectations of these different skills as well. But then it also has an entire section um, that really discusses how to promote and how to strategize and work on each of these skills. And what I'll say is that you shouldn't feel like, and this is probably not a good thing for a psychologist to say you shouldn't feel, but, but, but you, you shouldn't sort of feel like you have to do it all, <laughs> right? Because oftentimes that's how it can feel like, oh, we've got to do all these strategies, we've got to buy all the books, we've got to get all the programs. No, it doesn't need to be that way. And you're going to also think about these things within the context of where your child is in the moment, okay? And what things they're struggling with most. And you might actually see that as they improve in one skill, you can step away from that and say, hey, we prioritize the most important skill. Now let's move on to the next most important thing that we need to work on, right? So doing it all at once can also be overwhelming for kids. So whenever I'm talking about these strategies and thinking about them, I, I'm thinking about what is the thing that a child needs help with the most? Let's work on that skill first. 
build it up until it becomes automatic for them. It doesn't feel so effort, effortful for them. And then maybe move on to the next skill that I then want to target. But it's really important to be flexible, is what I'm saying, with all of these skills and all of these different strategies. And this is, these are not exhaustive lists of strategies. Rather, these are just some helpful tools. And I think it has to be individualized to your child, too. So it doesn't make sense for me or anyone else to stand up here and say, you should be doing this stuff with your kid. This is exactly what they need. If you don't do this, you know, it's not about that. It's about really understanding what strategies are going to work for your kid and also understanding, going back to understanding your own strengths and your own things that you can really teach your child because there's probably so much that you know how to do that they might struggle with and it's really about taking the time to be explicit and teaching them those things that you guys know so well. So, but with planning and with most types of skill drilling, it really is important to be explicit when creating any plans. We know that children, while they can learn a lot from their environment and pick up things sort of like through, sort of just seems like osmosis, kids really learn the best, all kids, not just kids with executive functioning issues, but all kids, when instruction is direct, explicit, broken down, rehearsed, and modeled for them. So we can't just expect kids to be able to know Know what to do all the time. It's just, it's an unrealistic expectation and it's not as a criticism, it's as a, you're going to end up getting yourself frustrated in the long run by not having the, or, or teachers or whatever, by not having the appropriate expectations for what a kid can actually do if you haven't taught them yet. If they haven't been taught, how are they supposed to learn and how are they supposed to do it, right? So involving kids as much as possible is also really important. But you're their coach. You're going to be their, 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 their support system. You're going to love them. And you're going to be their network. You're going to help them out. And you're going to work through all of these different things with them. You don't have to always tell them what to do, but you can teach them what to be able to do. Um, so that's for planning. Some, some strategies for helping out with working memory. Um, having them be able to make eye contact can be really helpful before giving an instruction direction because they might have another thought in their mind and they might be in, distracted internally or by something else. So making sure that you have their full attention before giving a command or a step can be really helpful. Activating working memory by having them repeat back what you just told them can also be really helpful. That's just rehearsing and keeping information in that working memory loop a little bit longer. Um, and also prompting them with these different types of cues and rehearsal cues um, just before what you, what you expect them to be able to do. Also teaching different types of mnemonic strategies so that they can actually access the information and the strategies that you're teaching them through different keywords and acronyms. Task initiation, some things that you can do to teach that are um, um, breaking down overwhelming tasks into smaller parts. And I actually think for me this is one of the most helpful strategies that I see as being effective because I see oftentimes these kids just get so overwhelmed by what they need to do and they might not even have a really good clear understanding of what they actually have to do first. So giving them a step-by-step -step linear strategic breakdown of what the expectations are and what they need to do and what they need to acquire can be really helpful. Fostering flexibility, so coaching them through some anxiety-provoking situations. When it comes to dealing with different emotional challenges and executive functioning, it's really important that kids have skills. Right? Kids need coping skills. They need to learn to know what to do in a situation. And that needs to be taught explicitly as well so they can access that information and they just understand and they know it. And it's not just watching or expecting. And if you've taught them a skill, then, they, then you can expect that they should know what to do. Right? But it's really important for kids that have these emotional challenges that they do have a coping skill toolbox that they can refer to in moments of frustration, whether that's taking deep breaths or being able to step away from a situation or use some sort of um, tangible object that they can hold on to if they have some sensory challenges as well that also um, when their anxiety heightens they might feel like they need an extra sensory moment to be able to manage it. But coaching them through those moments is super important. Um, 
giving some expectation, um, breaking down things and giving expectations can also be helpful so that they know what to do next because it can be hard for them to, almost, to internally create a schema in their mind of what they need to do next or what the next situation is going to have in store for them. So you actually have to be able to do that for them and say, okay, we're going to the zoo today, for instance. Here's a step-by-step -step breakdown of the things that you can see at the zoo. These are the expectations for when we're at the zoo. And this is you know, this is our plan for the day. And actually giving them that plan allows them to access something that they might have trouble coming up with on their own or might not be easy for them. So rehearsing scripts can also be a really nice strategy for them also. So if they are stuck in a really hard or emotionally um, charged situation, they have a script that they can access in their mind to be able to calm themselves down. Whether that's step away right now, take a deep breath, count to 10, Right. And then strengthening attention. Um, there are a couple things on here that you can do. Um, giving a visual depiction of elapsed time can be helpful. We, we often see that kids with ADHD, and I'm not picking on the ADHD kids here, it's just something we see executive functioning problems often um, in, that, um, in that condition. They have trouble actually um, understanding, um, they have trouble time management, knowing how long things are gonna take. So they often will need some sort of visual depiction or timer so that they can refer to and to um, see how much time has elapsed while they're working on something. And then using incentive systems. So um, we see this as something super powerful and it's not, it's not, um, it's not meant as a way to make children dependent on external reinforcers for the rest of their life. That's not the goal. The goal is to start there and to eventually use these things to be able to build up skills so that they no longer need that same type of reinforcement. Okay. There's also a curriculum. How many of you have heard of uh, this type of program, organizational skills training? Oh, not many, okay. So this is actually a program um, that was started right here in New York City um, by the folks at the NYU Child Study Center. Um, Richard Gallagher and Howard um, Abikoff started this program for their kids that did have ADHD who were coming into their clinic because they often saw the challenges with organization and time management and planning. And so they um, actually um, ran, they got money for a pilot study and they used it to create this intervention program called Organizational Skills Training, OST. And uh, they found that it was incredibly effective and they published um, this manual um, for clinicians and, and, and um, people that to use um, for kids that have these different types of issues. And this is a really nice evidence-based um, program that can be used. There is a lot of information within the program on, um, on incorporating parents into the treatment as well and having parents be active um, in helping their kids and coaching them through a lot of the different um, skills at first and then eventually again fading and scaffolding out. But it's a really nice program. Um, I highly recommend it there. Um, um, for folks who are interested also, they actually do have a research study that is, I believe, ongoing right now um, where they will, um, um, you can um, participate in the research study and receive this type of treatment. I don't know if it's free or very low cost, but, um, but I know that, this, um, that they have this running at NYU right now. Is it for all ages? So, uh, OST, I, I don't know the exact starting age. I would say, though, that um, usually for kids around, um, I'd say late elementary, school would be sort of the youngest starting point, perhaps, where I, where I would start this type of program. Um, but you might get some really bright kids who are younger than that who might benefit from these strategies. Um, and as parents, these are really helpful strategies to learn as well. Um, but yeah, but I believe it's I believe it's late elementary though. I don't know exactly right now. Um, 
these are just some other um, organizational skills that, um, that I think um, can be really helpful for managing not only materials, but managing time as well. So for materials like school supplies, having homework bins, visual checklists, schedules and routines clearly posted, a lot of those, again, those external cues, because internally it's hard for them to map out a lot of these things. It's not impossible, it's not that they can't, it's just a lot harder for them. And managing time, giving consistent routines, lists, outlines, giving them a, a really clear plan can be really um, an effective strategy. Um, really helping children learn to be organized is important for school success and it's really important for life success. These are life skills that are important. Being organized, learning how to regulate your emotions. These are things we have to use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, some of the things that to me really pop out from this slide though is consistency. And it can be, it can be really hard to be consistent. <laughs> like no doubt about it. It can be really challenging to every day be able to refer to these skills and, and keep on doing these things. But what we see is that over time it becomes easier as well to manage and to be able to do these things. And if you stick with it for a little while you might see some small gains that then snowball into bigger gains as your child feels like they can actually have a boost to their confidence, as they feel like they can start to improve their self-esteem, as they start to feel like they can do things more independently and they don't need to rely so much on the adults in their life to support them. Um, so I think staying consistent, even if if it's really hard, just you got to sort of push yourself through it at first. Um, we talked about a lot of this stuff, breaking down tasks into smaller steps, rewarding and praising success. Again, don't be afraid to reward your child for the things that they're doing that you want to see from them. And label the things that they're doing in the moment that you expect of them and make sure they know it. So for instance, instead of just saying, nice job or good work, you could say something like, oh, I love how you put the toys away all on your own, okay? Let them know what they're doing because sort of vague things like nice or good job, children don't know exactly what you're referring to. So they need actually those, that specific label to praise so they can, again, understand exactly what they're doing that's getting reward from their parents. And you know what the most positive reward is from any parent to their child? Love. But yeah, I, I would say so love and but their attention. Your attention. That your attention is probably the most powerful reinforcer that you can give your child. Even if it's negative attention, guess what? That's still attention. No, seriously. Because in in we see often that, that negative attention can reinforce behaviors. Okay? Even the ones that you don't want them to see, even if you're inadvertently paying attention because it's disruptive. So it becomes again about managing your own expectations and sometimes letting some of the small stuff go. And and ignoring. <laughs> ignoring can be a really nice way of actually extinguishing a behavior that you don't want to see anymore. But it really is important to reward and praise children for their success um, and let them know what they're doing. Um, talk to them about how to make lists of things, break things down, model and coach for them. These are just, these are general principles that, again, you can apply to so many different things that you do throughout the day. But you have to understand that kids need that explicit direct instruction. They need the models, they need the coaching in order to be able to learn. Um, these are just some other assignment and homework strategies. How are we doing on time? 20 after. Oh, shoot. Okay. Um, ah, okay. So actually brings me to sort of, so I have some slides on sort of the research and what the research says on different executive functioning interventions. I'm going to go through this very, very quickly because I want to leave a couple minutes for questions. Very, very quickly. So um, the research on EF right now. What do we know? There's been so many studies done. We know, again, it's not only important for school success, it's important for physical health. Poor EFs are associated with obesity, overeating substance abuse, quality of life, um, school readiness. Um, EF is more important than IQ for school readiness. 
crazy, right? But true. Job success, marital harmony, public safety, all of these different things. And these are big studies that have been done now. This isn't just one isolated study. We're never going to establish a scientific truth based on one study. These are multiple replicated studies that have come out that have shown how important EF is for all different types of life things. Um, um, and this is from Adele Diamond's research. So if you guys Google Adele Diamond, she's great. She has so many materials and research articles. A lot of them are open access also, which is pretty cool. Um, here's basically what Adele Diamond, who synthesized sort of the um, what's been out there in the EF intervention sort of form, like um, she looks more at like formal interventions that are out there. What has she found? She found that EF training appears to transfer as we talked before, if you train working memory, you're going to see improvements in working memory. If you train cognitive flexibility, you're going to see improvements in that. But the transfer can be narrow to other skills. So if you train working memory, actually you're not going to see a lot of cognitive flexibility improve. If you train planning, you're not always going to see time management improve. So that's the other important thing to keep in mind. So practice the thing that you want to get good at. Right? That's like everything in life. You want to get good at something, you have to practice that specific thing. Um, just like everything else in life also, EF gains depend a lot on the amount of time spent practicing. That's what they found from their research review. Um, it's depend it is highly dependent on the way that's presented and conducted. They find that people who are really bought into these types of interventions in the research studies, they actually, those, the kids who are with the people who are more bought in and they're not just like rote going through an, uh, an intervention program, like they really feel strongly about it, those kids have better gains than the ones who have people who are, are not that are not that bought in. What does that mean for me on a school-wide level or sort of like a, a bigger uh, public health level? It means if you're implementing executive functioning interventions, formal curricula in your school, you better get all those teachers and staff on board and everybody needs to feel really empowered and passionate about this stuff in order to see big gains. Um, EFs need to be continually challenged to see improvements. So you have to push beyond their comfort zone. You can't just stay within the um, a comfort zone. That's when we see big improvements is when kids go, when you push them outside of that. Um, those with the poorest EF skills tend to get the biggest gains from many programs um, that are out there in the market. Once practice ends, some of these benefits diminish, okay? So I think it's really important within the context of everything else I told you guys tonight that you can expect that you can pull back on some of these things and the skill will still be there but you might see a little bit of a, a, a of a drop off and it might not be as easy because you're you're sort of pulling back but i do think also that probably some of this research and the way that they're thinking about it is like in very systematic studies where they have people come into a research lab they do what they got to do they send them home and and who knows that's just what i might think about it um and then um uh, differences between treatment and control groups and research studies only appear when their skills are pushed to limit. We talked about that. In aerobic exercise, there's been a lot of research on aerobic exercise for improving EF skills. What they find is that those that actually include a cognitive component, so for example, not just like working out, going to the gym, but actually um, things like martial arts, taekwondo, um, things that actually have a self-control, self-discipline component in addition to physical activity tend to produce better EF gains than those that are just focused on strength training or going to the gym or things like that. There are some formal school programs for EF um, um, that include physical activity components. Um, I'm going to take some time. There are a couple school curricula out there, but these slides will all be available to you guys if you're interested as well, I believe, through, yeah. So you guys can look through them, and, um, and yeah, and that's it. So thank you.